Okay, so what I'm going to do here is do this derivation, this direct stiffness derivation. Here is inverse of tear. There we go. Well, that was too much. So we're going to derive of this 1D beam element. Okay. All right. So we're going to get the six, the four by four K matrix. This is the four by four one, right? All right. This is what we started. Well, actually, I didn't start a class. I just kind of presented it. But uh, here we're talking about beam element that can deflect as follows. It has two degrees of freedom per node. V1 and a theta one, and then a lateral displacement at node two, and then also a rotation at node two, and you have a force at node one, an external force at node two, and then also a moment at node one, and then also a moment at node two. And we assume that the beam has an E and an I and an L, okay? So we know those things, all right? Gets a little funny. Okay. So the way we do this, this is kind of like a, a force method or a superposition method. Um, if you think of a stiffness matrix like this, that's unknown, right? And in this case, this is our four by four, right? This is our four by four stiffness matrix gets multiplied by a displacement vector, and that equals a force vector. If we assume a displacement, so we're going to assume displacements, and so for example, let's say we assume the following displacement, so that this is basically saying, uh, if you look at this type of mode, everything is zero. Theta 1, V2, and Theta 2 are all zero. The only thing that's happening is it's deflecting up one at node one. So actually that beam basically looks something like this. All right, It's that type of deflection pattern. And we can actually figure out using you know basically basic beam equations what is the force and moment and from that you know you can get the deflection and the rotation at those points. All right. Now when you do that, what you get here, when you multiply this through on this side, is you just get this first column because all the other effects go to zero. So this just becomes K11, K21, K31, K41. Likewise, if I use 0, 1, 0, 0, which looks something like this, gives you that type of deflection, I can extract the second column. Okay, If I do 0, 0, 1, 0, that'll give me a deflection that looks like this. And I can extract the third column. And then finally, the fourth column comes from 0, 0, 0, 1, which is a deflection like this. Actually, it's the wrong one. I got the wrong one. It goes like this because you have a positive rotation at that node. Okay, although it doesn't deflect. And you can't see that because I zoomed out too far. So we're going to actually assume displacements, use mechanics and materials to get these right-hand side vectors for those displacements, and then that allow us to directly get the stiffness terms in terms of that. Okay? So this is like similar to what I said. The stiffness matrix is basically like an influence coefficient. So what I'm actually doing this here is I'm saying, okay, as I move, keep everything fixed, and I just move the first degree of freedom, which in this case happens to be the displacement at node 1. How does that affect the force? That's what this first column does. Now, if I keep everything fixed and I just affect the rotation at the first node, that gives me the second column. All right. And likewise, if I look at just moving, displacing on the second node, that gives me the third column. And then if I look at the effect of the rotation, the influence of that on the force, that gives me the fourth column. So that's the approach we're going to do.
And I'll probably pause a couple times because it's a little bit of a long derivation. I might not go all the way through everything, but at least I'll set it up. All right, so to do that, I need to kind of know the solution to a couple of different little beam cases. So before we get started, I kind of need two solutions. I need to know if we have a beam that's fixed on the right hand side and has a force applied, call it P, and then a moment applied, I'm going to call it M. From this I want to be able to know what is the deflection at x equal to zero and the rotation at x equal to zero, okay? Where this is x and this length here is L. So this is the point x equal to L and this is the point x equal to zero. The other case I want to look at is when we're fixed on the left-hand side Again, we have a force acting up, but also a moment applied. And I want to know how this, again, now we got this is x, so this is x equals 0 here. Now we want to know for this loaded situation, what is v at L and theta at L, the rotation and the deflection at those points, OK? So you can go through and you can integrate, you can get the bending moments and then integrate those twice, divide by EI, and get the, the deflection and you know, the first derivative gives you the slope. Um, but since I talked about it in the class, let me talk about this book. This is another way of doing it. And like I really recommend this book. I think it's an excellent reference for most engineers. Let's hope that shows up. Something like that, maybe you can see it. Uh, this is a newer version. I used to have an older version, but uh, it disappeared from my office. And it just has a lot of stuff, so it's really useful. I mean, for example, well, what we're going to use it for is it has oh, my Lord. It keeps going. <laughs> Basically, at least this, I kind of stopped, but at least this many pages of beam and frame uh, tables. So, you know, of various loadings and constraints on beams and frames and what are the resulting forces and moments and stuff, okay? Plus, it's, you know, stuff with shells, flat plates, uh, torsion with warp. It has a good coverage of stress concentration factors, warping parameters, and cross-sectional properties, and so on and so forth. So it's very useful. Even if you know how to theoretically derive these things, it's real easy to make a mistake. So I think it's actually a good idea to be able to, you know, to have one of these books. So there isn't, as is often the case, the exact case you're looking for is not always there. But I think, I don't know whether it is on this one or not, with a moment and a tip force. Yeah, it has some that are similar in that you have moments and tip forces that are at different locations. But it's really not a big deal because we're going to look at two situations. You know, if this is, this is from Rourke, and actually Rourke has uh, the stuff going this way. So if we look at, we're going to look at actually two tables. One is, oh, it does have, wait, it does have, Uh, it has the guided, it doesn't have the, okay, so it has guided, but that's not really a moment. Right. Where's the old moment? Yeah, okay. So if we look at table, dash one, which is in section eight dash seventeen. This is the beam tables. 
And we look at case 1A. That is as follows. It looks like this. It has a beam bending down and it has a point here, W, that's at some distance A and has a length L and all that sort of stuff. So it's cantilevered. So it's close to this. It doesn't have the moment. And then and, and in our situation, we're going to let A equal to zero. But then if I also look at table 3A, it's, you know, it's case 3A in the same table, it is... bending moment here at some point in O where it's applied again at some distance A. Now in both these cases, A is going to go to zero. All right? A is going to go to zero. All right? And in this case, we're going to change the sign of MO because and, and the sign of W. So we're actually going to uh, get P by setting P is equal to minus W. And in this case, M is equal to minus MO. It's changing the direction of those. And then we're going to superimpose those two, and that will give me the tip in the moment. Okay, And what I want, again, is the deflection and the uh, rotation. So if we go and look at this one, all right, this one gives me uh, the deflection at A is minus W over 6 EI, this is that A, which is the left point, uh, times setting the little a equal to 0, I just get 2 L cubed. And then the rotation at A is equal to W L minus A squared over 2EI. So that's just pulling those right out of the book. Now we do the same for case 3A. And in this case, I get the deflection at A is MO times L squared minus A squared over 2EI. And the rotation at A is minus MO, L minus A, over EI. So they're close, but I have to do a couple of little sign changes on this, and that's all I really need works for, so I can put that away, I think. And uh, if you look at this, if we write this in terms of our sign conventions, because they have... Well, well, there's kind of two things going on here. One is, you can see, they've defined W down. They put the negative in here, so, so in fact, you know, they've got the right sense of the deflection. They're saying negative deflection is down, but their force is, you know, the positive sense of the force is down. So I'm going to flip that. So we're going to get that the deflection, and I'll write it this way, for this case, well, and I'll directly superimpose them. Let's directly superimpose them down here. So for this case, the deflection, let me use V, because that's what we use in the notation, at x equal to 0, from this first part is going to be P on 6. Well, I get a 3, because the 2 cancels with that. So I get 3 EI L cubed. All right? All right, now we add on to it this deflection, and our moment is changing sign, so this gives us a minus m l squared minus a, well, a, okay, I'm sorry, a goes to zero, so that goes away, over... 2EI. Alright? And did I copy those down? I put that right behind it. Did I do it the right way?
Okay, so that's our deflection for that case. Let's box that equation. And then let's do the same to get the rotation. Okay, so if we look at the rotation term, again, we let a go to zero. This w is change of sign, so I get a minus p times l squared over 2ei, all right? And then I add to it this case, and we get the sign change on that. So we get plus m times l over ei, all right? So I've added the two rotations, but I've done the sign change because my moments and my forces have flipped sign. Okay. Now this case is basically the same situation. It's just, I always forget what it is. It's, again, we have to worry about the signs. Things flip around and, and uh, so on and so forth. But you know in this case that it, the deflection at L is going to have the same types of terms. P L squared. I'm sorry, P L cubed on 3 E I. And then it's going to have an M L squared on 2 E I. Now the question is always, which are the signs? Because we have different sense of rotations, and well, actually the bending moment diagrams flip. So you can go back and re-derive all that stuff. But I think the easiest thing is just to do, uh, you know, think it through. I, I'm kind of a, actually a big proponent for engineers to be able to do like thought experiments and figure out what's going on. So if you just consider the tip force, right? What should be the sign in that term? Well, it should obviously be positive because if p is a positive value, the deflection goes up, right? Now, on the moment, should it be a positive or a negative? Well, again, it should be a positive because if I bend in that direction, right, if I have a positive moment, it's going to tow it up like this, and it's going to deflect up. So both of these should be positive. Likewise, on the theta side, let's write the two terms and do the same type of thought experiment. PL squared on 2EI, and then you have the ML on EI term. All right, again, if we just consider p, if we put p up you know, in the positive sense, that will give you a positive theta rotation. So that should stay positive. Now the moment also does the same, right? If you put the moment on in that sense, what you're going to see is it's going to give you a positive theta. So this should also both be positive. So we got this one associated with this case, and then associated with the other case, we have. Deflection at zero is P L cubed on three E I minus M L squared, that's an L, on two E I. And then the rotation is minus P L squared on two E I moment part of that is PL on EI. All right, so we're going to use those two cases, all right, and we're going to use those in these situations to, to back out the four columns of the stiffness matrix, okay? All right, I'm going to pause the video here, and I will pick it up in a, well, in the next video.